Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 658. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. Today's April 24th, 2021. All right, welcome to a special Saturday edition of Anglican Unscripted. George and I were predisposed this week getting our shots, number two for both of us. We Anglican Unscripted now has a 100% herd immunity. Thank you, Pfizer. Uh, or did you get Moderna? What'd you, which Moderna. One you? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Pfizer, Moderna. Um, and I traveled this week. We took a Monstro, our uh, RV camper, out of the Webster, Florida location. We drove up here to Philly. And in any other car, we had, you know, Honda CRV, uh, a Ford, a Chevy, whatever. You put it on the road and you drive for 15 hours. It's not a big deal. You drive 15 hours in a uh, 12 ton vehicle, pulling a vehicle, and the stress level's uh, 50% more, and it takes a little bit more time to recover. But we made it up here safely. We are in the city just north of the city of Philadelphia. Uh, we're going to be here for a week or two as we uh, camp and visit and see the sites and still work from the RV. Then we're going to go head up to New York and Connecticut and do our travels like we did last year. And we'll keep you informed as we travel. Kevin, would you please stop by and say hi to us? Yes. Uh, Jill and I are going to win. The, everybody has a, a better herd immunity in the U.S. sometime this summer. Start visiting people as we do our travels, or you can visit us, go out to coffee, whatever. But that doesn't happen yet. We're still in the early spring, and people are still getting their shots. But we do intend to do that. I get comments on Facebook all the time. Hey, you did. You drove by. You didn't say hi. For just a short more, <laughs> a couple more months, and then we'll we'll do a lot more visiting the people as we travel. And that's one of the things we want to do when we travel is uh, to go around, see different churches, different uh, people we know, and, and family and friends, and uh, just use the RV for more than just camping at KOAs. So, George, how is your week going? I'm exhausted, Kevin. I had my shots, and it's sort of slowed me down, turned me into a bit of a mush and a muddle, uh, making silly mistakes and things like that, because uh, I'm not thinking as straight and clearly as I'd like to. But in the parish, I almost feel like I'm starting all over where I was seven years ago when I came to the parish, where we had a, an annual, we had an average Sunday attendance of about 115, not 2014 or so. And that's what we have. Now we have about 100 right now. Now, last year, or 2019, we had 275. So 175 people have yet to come back, and I'm stopped holding my breath. And so I'm working as if I'm back to where I was seven years ago. Mm. And uh, just, uh, you know, encouraging people to bring their neighbors and doing outreach. And we're basically, our church grew because, not because of any sort of razzle dazzle or any of these great programs, but we really impressed upon the members, invite your neighbors, invite your friends, invite your family members. And that's how it grew. I would say 80% of our growth came from people asking their local friends, who then asked other people, who then asked other people. Sort of like Amway, I guess. Uh, <laughs> a little bit like Amway. Well, it was a stark reminder of how bad COVID has hit this nation. Uh, Jill and I were touring Philly uh philadelphia yesterday uh with some friends that met us down here and we're going to the sites the liberty bells the um place where they signed the declaration of independence where they talked about and, and put it on paper just the the, found, the founding when our nation became legal <laughs> so to speak and, and the and the documents were signed and the uh, i's were dotted and the, and the t's were crossed we got to visit all that yesterday in the middle of all that is this big building that serves as uh, a um, glorified food court. They have a wonderful restaurants in here, upscale restaurants. You go in there, and of the 12 to 15 different restaurants, four were open. The tourism trade has wiped out so many of these restaurants that they're out of business. Signs here closed, out of business, out of business, out of business. So basically, 
all that's left here in in the middle of Philly serving uh, the tourists is 25% of what it was before. Then last night we went for dinner. There's a ship parked in the uh, harbor here that serves as a, a a dinner out place. It's a really nice established restaurant. We go in there. We were the only customers. They opened two weeks ago, the first time since COVID, and we had four waiters at our table. Uh, I mean, there's just nobody. There's no <laughs> welcome. Hi. This is strange, you know, that we got the freshest food because nobody else was there to, you know, to, to eat. And so people aren't going to church like George's church. People still are uh, shuttered in. They're not going to see uh, the tour stuff. This restaurant in two weeks, probably one of the premier restaurants in Philadelphia, uh, has served 16 to 17 people in two weeks. Things have changed dramatically 125,000 small businesses have gone bankrupt since COVID started that's amazing that's an amazing statistic many of those businesses were established for more than 10 years it's not like uh, your average you know startup 50% of them fail this these are you know businesses have been going 5 10 and 15 years they were gonna make it they were doing just fine and the whole ethos of uh, external capitalism, going out and spending your money, has changed here in America. And George notices it. I notice it. What are we going to do about it? How do we uh, reach the locked-in community? People are still locked in from COVID, even though they got the two shots. They're not going out. My senior warden is a psychologist, a PhD psychologist. She's retired. Um, and she's been following the professional literature, and there, there's talk in this in the uh, medical community that there is a syndrome akin to PT uh, post traumatic stress disorder, or I forget the 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 where people are afraid to go out and re-socialize due to having been isolated for a year. It's akin to what people have uh, who've been in prison for a while. They're afraid of the outside world. It's akin to these people who are sort of afraid to leave their homes. And I've, I don't want to diagnose people, but I believe it's present among several members of our congregation whom I know who I who once were there every day doing something from mowing the lawn to being involved in various ministries and commissions and activities. And they're so fearful, they're still getting their groceries delivered, whereas 90% of their neighbors are now living normal lives. There's, mm -hmm. there's that residue of people who are being affected psychologically by all that's come in the past year. Yeah, I think there's probably a diagnosable level that we could have with this lockdown syndrome. And then there's just, you know, it's like it's like the end of the zombie movie when you come out and you're the survivor and there's nobody out. You're, you're walking my, my, through empty streets. My brother's son, my nephew, uh, started his freshman year of college in the fall, but he's at home um, mm -hmm. because the, his university didn't have in-class, in-person classes. And I have to tell you, my freshman year of college, I could not imagine mm -hmm. living at my... It was such a change in my life uh you know away from home you know new friends living on your own the excitement of being with you know thousand kids age poor guy's missing all that yeah. uh taking uh, his engineering classes online um oh the, the, no, I, well i think just you know the the millennial generation is missing a lot because they spend so much of their time doing this. Yeah. Uh, I was walking around Philly yesterday, and there are people who can walk and do this at the same time. I've, I, I can't do that. <laughs> I can barely do this sitting and concentrating on it. And they're just you know texting and Instagramming and walking and no big deal. They have two headphones in, and somehow they have one eye that's looking that way. One eye going that way and one eye on the on the thing. It's, you know, we're going to develop these uh, iguana eyes pretty soon where we just have complete uh, separate control through evolution. Okay, George, we should get to the news. Um, if you can, if you want, please participate uh, in your churches, 
in your worship. Uh, follow state and local rules, but it, it's time to get out. Uh, I think most of the people who watch this program in America have at least had one shot. Uh, two weeks after you had your second shot, you are able to go out uh, with at least 95% effectivity. Yeah, and and some of them have been vaccinated as well, apart from yeah. drinking heavily. But... What did I say? Shot. Shots. <laughs> oh, George. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually i had a shot the other night it was kind of cool mm -hmm. I, I celebrated my second shot with two shots of bourbon and i've discovered i have not been drinking enough because two shots of bourbon hit me really hard i go oh my i'm not in college anymore <laughs> so, after having driven 15 hours kevin uh, uh, that's probably all i needed yes all right that's all you needed on to the news um you and i have been doing this forever you and i actually did a show a long time ago with anglican tv called angles report from fort worth mm -hmm. fort worth has made the news again they've been fighting the property battle with the uh, 815 version of the episcopal church uh, for what seems like forever that's all been decided now and some uh, members of churches are being told to vacate those churches because they lost the legal battle and because of uh, the bad faith of their lawyers they're losing the church and i thought we could talk about that well bad faith in a not in a legal sense okay. bad faith in a conversational sense because we don't okay. want to be opening ourselves up to uh i go with what george said i, I don't get sued again so oh. go on <laughs> Two stories out of Fort Worth, uh, one good news and one sort of silly news. If you've uh, been following the news, the local Dallas and Fort Worth newspapers have had these sob stories this past week about five congregations who've had to vacate their properties because of the property litigation. And, you, and if you took away proper names and you watched these videos, these were stories that you have seen for 15 years of oh my parents are buried here what can i do we're being forced out and this and that and the other except this time around the episcopal church 815 is there those congregations are leaving properties that belong to the anglican church in north america the diocese of fort worth what's happening well as kevin says this is the bad faith not in a legal sense but bad advice and bad thinking and just this is the price that these people have paid for following the advice of their lawyers than following Paul's injunction about Christian suing Christian. The Episcopal Church's legal strategy has been uh, take no prisoners, slash and burn. And that's how they have uh, done it in Virginia and in New York, California, and in all, California all these places. Uh, they won't negotiate. Early on, Bishop Iker said to those parishes that wish to remain affiliated to the Episcopal Church, fine, let's talk. 815, some of them began to talk, and some of them you know, made arrangements. Then the Catherine Jefford Shorey and her lawyers stepped in and said, no, 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 it's all or nothing. Not only are we not going to talk to you, but we're going to take your properties. We're going to take all the other properties in Fort Worth away from you because of the Dennis Cannon and this and that and the other. Then we had 10 or 12 years of litigation. And after the U.S. Supreme Court refused to hear the appeal of the Texas Supreme Court, it's done. It's over. Now, the Episcopal Church's attorneys said, OK, whichever way this goes, the loser has 30 days to get out of their property, never thinking that they would be the losers. Now they're vacating their property. So all saints in Fort Worth and four other buildings are now reverting to the, the Episcopal Diocese of Fort Worth, which is Jack, which is Ryan Reed's diocese. And part of this story really is the dreadful secular reporting from the local newspapers who have gotten this story so wrong again and again and again and again that they're basically painting a false picture of what's been happening in Fort Worth so that when the when this outcome comes, all they can do is portray the acne diocese as being evil, greedy monsters. Now, for us in the Episcopal Anglican world who've been following this story for 15 years, you know, wait a second. 
we've, we've seen this again and again, hundreds of times. And so the, the Fort Worth story is finally coming to an end with the big plum All Saints Fort Worth having to move out. And that congregation is now worshiping in an Episcopal Day Schools chapel nearby. And I don't think AC and A will have any problem refilling that building. Um, oh, gosh, no. Yeah, I mean, that, I, you know, we don't want to ever go to court. If you do find yourself in court, you do want to be victorious. Uh, in this case, uh, it doesn't happen very often for the ACNA. They were victorious, and uh, they're going to go on. They're going to move on and, and, and continue uh, to worship as they, as they did before. So, Well, like, I'll give you an example of what bad faith, not in a legal sense, but just unchristian thinking and activities. The old rector at All Saints in Fort Worth, when the division came, he had always been an opponent of Bishop Iker. Mm -hmm. who was bishop at the time. And Bishop Iker wanted to go in and talk to the congregation and find out what they thought. He was going to present why we had done this, why 80% of the diocesan delegates had voted to leave the Episcopal Church nationally. And the rector refused to allow Bishop Iker to come. He refused to take to poll the congregation. He absolutely refused to cooperate in any way. And he brought in who was the president of the House of Deputies, Bonnie Anderson at that time. And he brought in the lawyers. And essentially, he, without really uh, working with the people in the yeah. congregation to poll them, he chose a course of action that 12 years later, he's gone. He's got his pension. He's set off wherever he is in his retirement cottage. Mm -hmm. But the people whom he led down a path of 10, 10 to 12 years of litigation, they're now out of their building. And here's the joke of it. I bet you half to three quarters of these people aren't going to leave their building. No. Most Episcopalians, most Anglicans just sit where they've been set for the last 25 years. And just because the guy at the pulpit or the girl at the pulpit changes, they're not moving. No, yeah. uh, so I, I, I don't see the... Uh, See, the difference is the ACNA, when they were expelled, th those people were more motivated by theological and ideology, ideological properties, whereas the Episcopal Church people are more, were more motivated by, we've always done it this way, and we don't pay any attention to the people at the top anyway, but, so why should we leave? So I, I think there's going to be some big shocks to the Episcopal Diocese of Fort Worth. Whether it's even a viable diocese remains to be seen. I think they all have, they have like 1,400 members in that diocese. How many are going to survive this? And why is it uh, why is it still counted as a diocese of the Episcopal Church? Well, and that's the that's the big issue here. At what point do you become the next diocese of Michigan? You know where you you. you more people watch this show in the first 20 minutes of it being published than go to church in Michigan, uh, in, in the Episcopal Diocese. Uh, so at what point does, you know, the 815 Diocese of Fort Worth do that? So um, good questions. Now, our second story is also related to uh, Fort Worth and, and Dallas. Uh, we had propositioned, uh, I think three weeks ago we talked about why uh, Christ for the sake of others was such the growing diocese and stuff like that. And I said, I don't think it's a growing diocese. I think it's because they have Christ Church Plano in them. And Christ Church Plano is the largest church in the uh, ACNA. And we learn now that Christ Church Plano is moving back into the Fort Worth, Dallas area. Uh, as their diocese, and I thought uh, that would be something we want to talk about because they are the largest church. They're certainly influencing. I uh, I love their rector, um, Paul Dinison. So, what are we going to? What pertains to the future of the moving back to to uh, a leadership role in Fort Worth, Dallas area? Christ Church Plano is going to be affiliating with the Diocese of Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. Now, the long-term goal has been to form a missionary district of Dallas. Now, uh, to get from here to there, though, they're going to move out of Christ for the sake of others into Fort Worth. I believe earlier in the month or last month, it's their clergy attended the Fort Worth Clergy Conference, Clergy mm -hmm. Retreat. Now, some people say, oh my goodness, how can this evangelical dot parish have anything in common with Anglo-Catholic Fort Worth. Well, 
they're basically on the same page on the women's orders issue, I believe. Um, so there's an affinity there. It may not be in worship forms, but there's a stronger, there's a strong theological affinity. I may be, if I'm wrong, fact check me on this, folks. Yeah, I, I'm on their website. I don't know their um, stance one side or the other on the women's orders issue. Well, I, I, as I said, fact check this and let, let us know. Yeah. But there's an affinity there that's theological and uh, pastoral. And they're going to be affiliating with Ryan Reed's diocese. And who knows if this is a long-term or a short-term partnership. Mm -hmm. We don't know. Yeah, it, it can be interesting to see uh, the future in that. Uh, very successful church. Uh, was it a it was a successful church when it was an Episcopal church uh, some you know, fifteen years ago? So uh, it's interesting to watch that type of stuff. Well, what's fascinating though is uh, uh, at the time Christ Church pulled out of the Episcopal Diocese of Dallas, it pulled out because it's lay people, the money, the, the clergy followed the money. It wasn't the first thing that the clergy wanted to do where we have to leave, but it was a lay led push where the clergy went along with it. And I think we're seeing the same sort of thing here of the, the way the congregation is shaping up. They're more comfortable with what they see and feel and be part of this Texas Anglican community than a more dispersed Anglican world. All right, we've talked about Fort Worth enough. Let's transition overseas. This is Anglican Unscripted, so we get to talk about the Church of England every once in a while. And if you haven't been paying attention, the Church of England has gone completely woke. It's it's woke as you get. And that's kind of the news I've been reading from my Facebook feed all week long is we are racist. So, hey, great, let's talk about it. It's, you know, it's the latest thing here in America. It's happening at the corporate level. It's happening at the church level. It's happening at the education level here in America. Why would not the Church of England be a leader in this as well? Um, let's do a little timeline, though. Uh, Justin Welby has always kind of been the woke Archbishop of Canterbury. Yes, Justin Welby uh, apologized for his British institutional racism about a year and a half ago he apologized for british he went to amritsar and apologized for the massacre of sikhs a hundred odd years ago by the british army and mm -hmm. so on and so forth and justin welby has always been pounding this tune uh, i think you're pounding your table there stop playing with the microphone well justin welby has been pounding he really seems to be trying different themes for a, few, a year or so he was the ecological archbishop and then he was the labor archbishop and the poor archbishop remember we had all this talk about uh payday loans and then we had green uh, anglicanism and then we had bishop Welby appearing at a trade union or as a labor party conference talking about social democracy okay he's now on a new kick and it's racism and it's been, it's been building he's been trying different themes then we had the whole black lives matter summer of last year uh the United States, we're all very familiar with it. England, they had it as well. And in response to this Black Lives Matter, the British government set up a commission called the British Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparities. And it was a body of 10 experts, and only one of them was of white European background. Nine were from British ethnic minorities, Asian, African, so on and so forth. And these people were drawn from the uh, broadcasting, the police, the academia, from medicine. And these were people of thoughtful accomplishment. And they were put together a report on racism in, racism in the UK. The Church of England also started a racism commission. Well, the British government racism commission reported back first and this report was a serious kick in the groin to the professional race baiters in England. Because what it said is, yes, racism exists, but no, Britain is not a racist country the way it is being painted in social media and by the uh, professional crybabies. And they pointed out that uh, 
for 14 year olds, for instance, uh, the educational attitudes and attainments of age, uh, Asian 14 year olds is greater and African, British African 14 year olds is greater than for British white 14 year olds and British white 14 year olds have greater attainment than British West Indian 14 year olds. Why do West Indians, Jamaicans do worse than people from Nigeria? And they're subject to the same racial disparity. Absolutely. And so what the commission says, racism has become the catch-all factor that people just throw out there when their social, familial, cultural, economic, demographic reasons for disparities between uh, an education and outcome. So that, yes, right, the government should do everything it can to remove barriers caused by racism, but no, Britain is not institutionally racist, and it does a pretty good job, all things considered. Well, this report caused hysteria among the professional racists in the Church of England. The College of Bishops of the Diocese of London said, oh, no, 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 this is wrong. Uh, the, the woman uh, suffragan of Dover, uh, Rose uh, Hudson Wilkes, Wilkes Hudson, who is the first black female bishop in England, who is only the first black female bishop in England because she's a black female. She has no actual merit to uh, warrant this position, and she certainly has done a crappy job as bishop. You know, well, went in, off in the tangent. church. Of, yeah, hold on, in the Church of England, that's kind of a warrant to be that's, a bishop. <laughs> you know, that's a really, really hard thing to beat. You know, so she went off that. Oh no, this is all terribly wrong. And then the British Church, the Church of England, released its Racism Commission report, which is shot full of critical race theory and wokeism and ha and is frankly anti-christian in its ethos um christ came not to save uh greek and jew male and female slave and free christ came to put down the white man and to elevate the black man and we're not going to sort of classify the chinese man in the same category as the white man um it, it it is just dreadful, dreadful paganism masking as Christian compassion, this mm -hmm. a race theory. And, and then, yes, on Thursday, the Archbishop of York, Stephen Cottrell, who must be one of the dumbest people on the House of Bishops of the Church of England in his lack of self-awareness, he's going on and on about there's not enough senior minorities in, in high places in the Church of England. And he replaced a black man as Archbishop of York. Well, I have I've got something for step you, Stephen. Why don't you just down. step down? Just get a step down. And you know, here you're the problem, and you're complaining about the problem. Well, oh, that's because he's white. He doesn't know he's racist. And if he thought he was racist, that's even not racist enough. Well, it's you know they have these recommendations like there be a minority on every short list for a senior position. And if there isn't minority, there must be a reason why there's not a minority. Mm -hmm. In other words, this is tokenism taken beyond any uh, sense of reasonableness. Merit has nothing. Now, we've all along known that merit has nothing to do with the selection of bishops in England. It's the old no. boys network. It's extremely. And awful. maybe these, this racism commission of the church is being fair because they realize there's nothing spiritual. There's nothing theological. These not, are not men and women of God. These are people in the right clique. And now we want to explain the clique to get our crew in. Rather than allowing Christ to lead the church through the work of the Holy Spirit in raising up men and women to be leaders. I mean, this... I very much doubt that the power will be given up by the inner circle. And so we'll get token people on token committees who will, will get token appointments or made up jobs. Uh, but certainly, um, this is a case of uh, the Church of England is now even more work woke than the Anglican Church of Canada. And that's well, it, saying a lot, folks. It is. Well, I mean, it, it has become a counterfeit church. Um, critical race theory is a counterfeit gospel for secularism. You know, it's their way. We have a way that we can make the world peaceful again. And when we would do that by identifying what's wrong with the world, racism. It's like, 
When I was a young kid, I read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Every answer was 42. In critical race theory, every answer to every problem is racism, white racism. So here we have a counterfeit gospel. The no surprise that the Church of England has taken that on. The churches across America are taking that on. Even the Southern Baptist Convention is taking uh, this ethos, this uh, contemptible gospel into their their realms to to do what? What is the end result of this? The end result is death and destruction. That's the practical result. The practical result, absolutely. Their so. desired result is to feel affirmed by being nice. Mm -hmm. But the end result will be the further destruction and collapse. We've seen the universities collapse as institutions of standing in our culture. Used to be you people went to Harvard, Princeton, and Yale, and so on, from Indiana and Idaho, based on merit. And then they went back, and these were merit-driven places. And then they started discriminating against Jews. We have too many Jews. Now they discriminate against Asians. We have too many Chinese students. When they, we have too many white students. We have to have this, that, and the other. And so now that these degrees mean nothing, and we have these poor children coming out with 200 quarter million dollars in debt with gender studies degrees. And that's exactly right. I read an article a couple weeks ago about a professor, and I think she's an adjunct professor, that's why she got fired so easy, who said, and she's in Ivy League, I'm training a, a class full of minorities to be law lawyers, and they are not going to be able to get the job worthy to pay the loans that they just took out. They are not Ivy League level lawyers. They won't be. Mm -hmm. uh, because we aren't taking the, the cream of the crop like we used to. We're taking mm -hmm. anybody who's willing to apply to this school. And that does not work in, in the professional world. Well, thankfully, the professional world is now, the career world is now adopting CRT, so they'll hire them anyway. But we, we now have lowest common denominator in our education, in our uh, enterprise, in our careers, in our churches. And please don't be surprised if that fails. Because other countries, China, are not doing the lowest common denominator. Russia, not doing the lowest common denominator. Uh, very successful European com uh, countries, n you know, no such thing as the lowest common den denominator. So, well, the I French have perfected the art of hypocrisy. Yes, <laughs> where they still have merit-based institution institutions, but then they have the uh, token institutions. So that you get the best, the best of both worlds, where they have the real pros trained at these institutions, then you have the tokens trained at these institutions who then get government jobs. Uh, it, uh, we should really model ourselves on the French and not be ashamed of our hypocrisy if this is the path we're going to go down. You know, ironically, the French is going anti-woke. <laughs> like, you don't understand, you don't, especially with the transgender stuff. This is the, like, this is stupid. Yeah. Le stupido. So that's not the French word, whatever. So um, it's 2020 was a surreal you know, year. Uh, 2021 doesn't look any better it, from a sociological standpoint. You know, what I see happening in Western nations with this wokeness is just a miserable mess if your answer to every question is it's racism <laughs> that's not the answer you know that is a false gospel that is a counterfeit gospel i guess i'm a bit of a libertarian because i sort of look at it like the u.s government has kept chrysler and general motors from going out bankrupt for years the and chrysler and general times. motors yeah. make the worst cars that you can buy you just don't buy a dodge you just don't buy a chrysler if you want it to last more than three or four years um toyota and honda came into this country as jokes and 30 years later uh try buying a secondhand toyota yeah. and see what you pay versus a secondhand chrysler take a 
2017 Dodge versus a 2017 Toyota and see who see what the market will price those products at. We're going down the same road where we have merit-based uh, small businesses. We have merit-based institutions that people are uh, clamoring to be part of or to take advantage of and to use. And then we have the institutional monstrosity that is not based on merit, that is not based on outcome, but is based upon awarding the spoils. And those systems don't last. At a certain point, there's not going to be any more money for General Motors or Chrysler. You would think so, but they keep getting these bailouts. Um, <clears throat> cars for uh, cash for clunkers. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> I know. All right, George. And, and now, and here's the, here's the joke of it. Yeah. Now that President Trump is out of office, guess where General Motors is moving their factories back to? Back Mexico. to Mexico. Yeah. Get, a, get a GMC truck and a taco on sale. All right. So I think we covered all the news. Oh, no, Indian corruption. There was actually a real Indian corruption story this week on Anglican Deck, Inc. Uh, tell us, George. Well, it has to be a really high bar for an Indian corruption story to make it into the news. Mm -hmm. but, but the bishop, uh, Timothy Ravinder, the bishop of Coimbatore, which is in southern India, has been arrested again for theft from the diocese. Again. This man has been arrested three times by police and has three active criminal investigations for three different frauds against the diocese. The latest action is that he's pocketed the clergy's retirement uh, contributions wow. and not paid it into the church pension funds. About, oh, I think it was 15 million, 150 million rupees, about three and a half million dollars. I'm just guessing. Mm -hmm. he, and four he and three confederates have been pocketing this and the police are investigating. His predecessor uh, went, was, the first Indian bishop kicked out of office because his corruption was so bad and he wound up in jail. And, and before that, this his predecessor was somebody I knew at the Lambeth Conference in 98 who was as crooked as they came. The, the Indian church, South Indian church, its episcopate is just not all of them. There are the exceptions, but the majority of them have their hand in the till and Episcopal offices are bought and sold. Uh, it's the, the worst of the Italian Renaissance Medici times with the, with the Episcopacy being a vehicle to make money. Um, yet Christ still lives in the Indian church in places, but it doesn't live in the, in the Episcopate. Yeah. A lot of, you know, I want to say some of that is cultural, you know, I, uh, we certainly know in China there's, uh, the, the business practices are culturally different than here in the capitalist Western America. So uh, I, I, I don't know. We didn't talk That's about- That's racist, Kevin. That's racist. Just... Let me let me foreshadow that the two or three trolls that like to come to our site, that's racist, whatever you say, that's uh, racist. racist. I have another racist story. We didn't do this in the pre-show. I don't know how we missed it. The most active story on Anglican Inc. this week was about the Free Church of England and uh, their primus, uh, John Fennick. And I thought we could talk a little bit about that real quick. Um, I have not followed the story. I'm sorry. I was driving an RV on I-95 this week, 15 hours. I'm tired. So I got a couple of emails back and forth from personalities involved in this. I don't know. What's going on, George? Nobody knows. Nobody um, knows. I hate to say it that way, but there's a church in Middlesbrough, which is in the northeast of England, mm -hmm. that the Free Church of England Central Council shut down and they're liquidating its assets. And there is a question as to where the money is gone. And the, another the, church. Okay. So th this church had money in, a, in its coffers, in its bank accounts. They liquidated the church. Where is that money? The the legal documents for the for the uh, title to the church said that if it's liquidated, it needs to be distributed to the poor of the area. Mm -hmm. That's not been done. It's not gone into certain category. Where's the money? And so there are accusations, which I hate to say it, were leveled on the comment sections of Anglican Inc. Uh, back and forth between the two sides mm -hmm. of misappropriation of funds and that oh you're a lunatic back and forth and frankly the 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 police uh 
are investigating, the Charity Commission is investigating, and at this stage we can't really say anything because we don't know anything other than the accusations, and the accusations are there for all the world to read. Sure. That Bishop Fennec has been accused of masterminding the uh, theft of funds. Bishop Fennec and his supporters say that's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, the funds are being used for the furtherance of the work of the church. Then there's a petition being launched to get rid of Bishop Fennec because of his management. And it's just... Uh, well, After the initial stories came out, until we have some sort of actually independent fact finding, all we can do now is re reiterate the claims of both sides. And you and I over here, without access to the accountants, yeah, yeah, have no, no it, way of verifying these. And that's why we let the system work its way out. This is going to be investigated, and uh, hopefully, we get a copy of the investigation so we can report that as well. Um, we do have one other Anglican story, Kevin. The uh, Hold on, it's the not... Rod Thomas story. Rod Thomas, oh yes, uh, we had said the last three weeks when we we're talking about the Jonathan Fletcher report, who's going to lose their jobs? I'm not going to lose my job over this, and George isn't going to lose his job over this. Somebody in England should probably be losing their job over the uh, the Jonathan Fletcher cult, is what we called it. Um, Rod Thomas said. I'll step down. Am I reading that right? Yes. Rod Tom, uh, the, the, the uh, incumbent of Emmanuel Wimbledon has refused to step down. Mm -hmm. the, uh, in, the rector of, or the incumbent of St. Helens Bishop, uh, St. Helens in London has refused to step down and has attacked the, uh, the reports. And Rod Thomas seems to be the only decent man in the bunch on the top of the heap, and he's offered his resignation to Justin Welby, and Justin Welby declined to accept it. Oh, he said, I want to assure you that I believe it is right to hold myself to account. That's, so that's it, amazing it, words from anybody in the Church of England. Yeah, and here I spent 20 minutes rubbishing the bishops of the Church of England, and here's one who did the honorable, decent thing. Yeah. So... Okay. I've to, just proven my theory in the beginning of the show. <laughs> okay, but to be clear, uh, Justin Welbin said, "No, you're not. You're not standing down." So, you know, I'm glad he offered it up, and you know, it's, it's just one of those th things. You know, that this Justin Fletcher uh, cult that we've reported on, we'll be talking again in the future about it. There are so many victims here that this story will probably not die, and will be an example of how to avoid this in the future. If you have, well, you know. The, Here's something that just strikes me is um, why I don't have anything personal against Justin Welby. I, I don't know the man personally. Um, I was initially very excited when he became Archbishop because of the reputation he brought in with him. Mm -hmm. But either he's just so badly advised or he just has an unerring sense of picking the wrong thing to say. Part of the talk about uh, the racism in the Church of England was that the former racism chief resigned and accused the Church of England of racism. Big shock there. Uh, prof a professional pro a professional witch finder for racism finds racism wherever she looks for it. And one of the things that she revealed was that people who had complained about racism were asked to sign non-disclosure agreements uh, with the Church of England and settlements. And Justin Welby said, we'll never, ever, ever, I'm absolutely against non-disclosure agreements in the Church of England. Except for sex. What about all the non-disclosure agreements about abuse? You're happy to talk about, we'll never use them for racism, but you use them all the time for the abuse issues. Mm -hmm. um, Justin, think before you speak sometimes, because you've opened yourself up to a charge of hypocrisy. You're willing uh, to go to the nth degree on imaginary racism but you're not willing to act on real abuse. You... Yeah. It, it, it hurts right here in the deepest part. How is the kingdom yeah. of God being furthered by this work that he's yeah. doing? Where are the fruits of the spirit in this work? There's a reason nobody seeks a news media quote from a bishop or archbishop 
on the shores of the UK. There's the reason. Just to, I'm letting you know right now. You have lost your voice. You have lost your your counsel to the world, and it's your own damn fault. I mean, I'm pleased to say that our former co colleague uh, Gavin Ashenden mm -hmm. had more uh, public exposure with the den with, during the Prince Philip oh, thank you. Than ceremonies any, yeah. than any bishop in the Church of England who wasn't actually performing the service. Mm -hmm. They don't have bishops uh, of the Church of England being asked the questions that Gavin Ashenden was asked. Mm -hmm. And Gavin Ashenden is a Roman Catholic, but he and has a sense of gravitas and knowledge. Nailed every interview. I mean, he, mm -hmm. you know, he's absolutely he's a, he is a a benefit to the society of of, of Britain. You know, no doubt about it. All right, George, we have gone over a special Saturday show. And I'm talking slower because I just drove 15 hours. I'm a little tired. And can I just say, I've had to change my footwear, George, now that I'm up here in Philadelphia. For six months, I walked around in flip-flops through the winter in Florida. I've now had to go into the back closet in the RV and grab my woolly, puffy slippers because it's cold up here. <laughs> <laughs> it's 50 degrees. It's cold. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 650, was it eight? Yeah, it's a, well into the 600s, well into the 50s, nailed it at eight. You got it. 658 of Anglican Unscripted.